All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego, and today I'm joined by Rich Milliman, who is in Shelton, Connecticut, and Rich is the CEO of Extra Duty Solutions. Um, so, Rich, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people know that selling into the public sector, what we're going to talk about today. Uh, is very different and a lot of companies actually avoid the public sector because of it because they don't really know how to sell into it so why is it so different well i think there's a few reasons for it one reason is um there's a lot more checks and balances um oversight from different organizations in the in the public sector we sell into law enforcement which means we're selling to municipalities we're selling to cities mm -hmm. we're selling to states um counties and there tends to be a lot more external um, checks and balances um, that um, need to be followed relative to corporate or private sector selling. Um, and as a result, that tends to, uh, there's, there's rules and regulations that everybody has to follow and that's all there is to it. And it tends to slow, th slow things down a little bit. The other, another factor in that world is like for us, we're selling into a police department, but that means we also need to get the business administrator, potentially the mayor, chief financial officer, who work in other areas of the municipality on board. And you know everything from syncing up schedules for meetings and conference calls to uh, getting to the top of the pile can take weeks, months, or even years in some cases. Mm -hmm. So um, there's, a, there's a lot to unpack there. So from a from a, a sales point of view, number one, there's a lot of knowledge needed. Is it to keep up with the regulations, to know where the red tape is, to know how um, all the um, thing you know schedules you need to be on, etc. I mean, how does how how does that work? I mean, do, do you have to continually do research, continually be updated on on any changes? Yeah, it's, it's, it's mostly from the standpoint of being aware of what's going, of, of who's looking for what product. Um, mm -hmm. um, in some cases, it's similar. You know, there are conferences where you can reach out and talk to people you're trying to sell to. But in a lot of cases, once that entity is interested in buying your service, that's when the kind of the regulations come in. So they might have to do a request for a proposal, an RFP. Mm -hmm. So you need to be constantly up to date on who is issuing what RFPs and you have to, um, you know, typically you subscribe to one or more services that will, that will, that will uh, show you that. Um, and yeah, and, and you have to be a, a aware of um, what communication can fall under Freedom of Information Requests Acts and um, what's Oprahable and what's not and so on. So yeah, you do have mm -hmm. to kind of keep up on this, uh, on the ever changing landscape. And it seems also from what you said that you're selling to so many different constituencies uh, sometimes that obviously it, it takes some skill to be able to communicate to in different ways to different constituencies according to what their needs are and how they want to be communicated with. Yeah, it's, and, it, and not just the communication, but understanding what's their agenda. I mean, what, what, mm -hmm. what are they looking for? What are they trying to protect against? Um, and making sure that you're preparing your pitch um, to meet the right needs. The way I would talk to a police chief and the way I talk to a CFO are two different things. Mm -hmm. um, and then if they're both in the room at the same time, you need, you need to be aware of how you're going to uh, interact so that so you don't lose one. Yeah. And, and I guess as part of that too is, I mean, obviously sometimes the needs, the business needs of these different people can be, can be quite different, right? And almost, almost in conflict sometimes. Almost, yeah. I was, I was, I was going to say the same thing, almost in conflict at some times where, um, you know, it's the, the, the police side may really want something, whereas the financial side may have an, a, an issue with it or the risk side or the HR side. Even within the police department, you may have the command staff wanting something and the union wanting something else. So there's there's a lot of different. It's quite different than like you're selling into the head of, you know, to the head of HR in a corporation. Mm -hmm. It's usually a fairly uh, siloed sale. This mm -hmm. tends to be very very messy and far reaching. Yeah, and the other thing you mentioned there that it can be quite a long drawn out process. So I mean, I guess at times you have to have a lot of patience in order to 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 just uh, see the process through. 
Yeah, we've had, we have a couple that have been going on two years now. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, something uh, something comes up and it gets back burner, then it gets front burner. And it's that's common. And one of the issues with that is in a two year period, you can have people changing jobs. You could go halfway down the path for a year with a particular uh, business administrator of a municipality and all of a sudden he leaves and goes to another town and you're starting over again. So, yeah, that's that's all part of your sales uh, costs. So, I mean, given all of this, uh, some people who are listening might say, why, why would you ever even want to sell into the public sector given all of this? But tell me why, why selling into the public sector is actually a great place to be. Well, for us, we provide a service to the, service, to the public sector. So it's not mm -hmm. like our services of value to the uh, private sector. Sure. But there's a lot of rewards too. I mean, typically once you're in, you're in, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So our retention rate is extraordinarily high. Um, and uh, there, there tends to be, um, uh, what you're selling tends to be pretty uh, highly specific. And so there may be less, uh, less people selling it. Um, and it, and it, and it is a, um, you know, a relationship sale. There is this red tape around it and bureaucracy and so on. But in, in a, it, at its foundation, there is a relationship sale. So by the time you get to the end of the sales process, it's not like you're starting from scratch. You're, you're, you're now serving the people you just went through that process with. And it makes it a lot easier to ramp up and onboard. Yeah. And I guess one of the other things is you're pretty much always guaranteed to get paid, right? Yeah. I mean, we, for the most part, we, we, uh, we, the way we serve um, the municipalities, we are providing a managed service to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Our invoices are actually going to the customers of law enforcement, so private entities right. that are hiring, uh, to, uh, hiring officers. So we still have some level of bad debts, for, but for the most part, um, people are not looking to stiff law enforcement. Uh, you know, yeah. you're going to not pay some other bill first, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably not the best move uh, right, is to right. see law enforcement. Yeah, there's probably other people if you're so inclined that you'd probably... Exactly. <laughs> So when you, um, when, if somebody was interested in becoming a salesperson in an organization like yours and, and selling into this sector, what kind of characteristics and traits do you need? You need, you need, you really need somebody with t tenacity is really what we look for first, because as we mentioned, it's a long sales process and there's a lot of nooks and crannies in it. It can go a lot of different ways. So you need somebody who's not going to quit quick who's not going to say, oh, this is, a, I'm going to look for an easy sale. This is a hard sale. They're all going to be hard sales. It's just a different uh, level of hardness and type of hardness. So you need somebody who understands you got to build a pipeline and yeah, you're going to have rolling successes, but it's, you know, it's going to be three to 12, even 24 months afterwards that you mm -hmm. start getting your successes. So you can't have somebody who is easily discouraged. If somebody needs instant gratification, your first sale has to be within two weeks this is not where you want to be. Yeah. So how do you keep, uh, so how do you, uh, or how do your salespeople like and, and keep themselves motivated during the ebb and flow of these, of these um, sales processes? Well, first of all, some of these contracts are very, very big, right? And they mm -hmm. tend to be long-term contracts. In our case, they just keep rolling over. Um, so, uh, you know, it's kind of, I, I liken it to kind of like selling uh, mega yachts. Like, yeah, you probably don't sell that many, but each one costs $30 million, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, and it, it's really just more the, the first year or so where the person has to just understand and be constantly coached that you will not have many successes this first year. We're going to carry you. We're going to help you out. And by the second year, they realize what the sales process is like. And they start seeing some of the benefits of the first year efforts turning into actual sales. And uh, from, the, from there, they tend to be okay. But um, yeah, you really need to um, hold hands that first year with somebody in this, in this market, especially if they're coming from the private and then entering the public sector, because they're probably gonna have uh, more of an attitude of you know, what, what I did last month, I'll benefit from this month. And in our world, right. it's more what you did last year, you'll benefit from this year. Yeah. And um, so what are, as maybe somebody in there looking at somebody in their first year, what are the things that you look for throughout the year to say, yeah, this person is going to really work out and be great? Right. You know, one is just the, the lack of this. Don't get discouraged when mm -hmm. you're, you think you're about to make the sale and then you find out you have to go to another meeting because there's another constituency within there that has to. So you, 
you have to just keep going on it. The second is the ability to realize that this is a complex sale and it's not just taking one person out to dinner and mm -hmm. you know you can't take these people out to dinner. There's rules against <laughs> yeah. that. So, so it's realizing that you're going to have to sort of keep track of all the parties involved, what their needs are, what their wants are. Uh, it's not following up with one person typically. It's following up with different people who have different needs that all fall under the umbrella of one sale. So we look for people who are, in addition to being tenacious, are pretty organized around that and have the ability to shift gears as they need to depending on who they're talking to in a particular sales process. Yeah, and it seems to me that one of the, from what you're saying there, one of the big skills is, if you like, being able to map out the, what we what we call in our CRM, the buying center, where you, you have all the different people who are involved and influence at different points. And we have it where you can lay it out visually. But I think that obviously sounds like one of the most important things to be able to identify all the constituencies and what their role is and who they influence, who they're connected to, all of those things. So somebody who can look at things in a, as I said, more in a political map sense. Right. I think the way you just said it is exactly right. In a political map sense, because it's very, very rare that we walk in and everybody in that municipality that we're going to have to touch is on the same page and in agreement mm -hmm. that we want to go forward with this particular service. Typically, you have to figure out who is in favor and who's not in favor and then go from there. So every, every sales process is unique and different and you have to be okay with that. It's, it's almost more like consultative sales as opposed to any other type of sales that I've been familiar with. Yeah, and I, and I guess that's uh, and you're probably in that situation. Yeah, as we said earlier, because you might have conflicting um, agendas there. I mean, being able to figure out who is a naysayer or somebody against it is just as important as trying to figure out who are the people who are in favor. Yeah, and that's not going to be easy. It's it's not going to be typically. I mean, it isn't mm -hmm. always not the case, but typically the naysayer is not going to say, "Hey, I'm I'm the naysayer." Right? Yeah, I mean. Yeah. They're going to try and torpedo from the background. They're going to be nice to you in your face. And then, you know, afterwards they go to the mayor or they go to a, a council member and say, this is a horrible idea without telling you. So you have to have a, a bit of a sixth sense for that too. And, and, and make sure that you've got multiple people involved. So somebody can't go around the side and torpedo it. Mm -hmm. And so how, how has, uh, how you sell, how has that uh, changed during this, um, during this period, because I mean, maybe, I mean, as you said, it's very relational. Maybe you haven't been able to get in front of people in the way that you were before. So have you managed to do this and still be able to do what you're saying, like have a sixth sense, be able to figure out where people are without actually probably being able to meet them in person? Yeah, no, a lot of our sales have, be, have gone more towards the video or a phone calls as opposed to in person. Um, and it does, it makes it tougher. It's a lot easier to figure out somebody's interest level when you're sitting right in front of them and you can read their body language mm -hmm. than when they're on a, you know, a phone or even a, a video conference. So it's, it's just gotten tougher. And, and also with the COVID, um, a lot of things just get pushed back. Like, you know, yeah, we're interested in talking to you, but let's just wait till we can meet. So mm -hmm. we now have, um, you know, a bigger pipeline than we normally do. We're probably 10% less in actual sales than we normally do for this time of the year too. So, Again, you have to be patient with this. You have to kind of roll with the punches um, and not get discouraged over it. Yeah, and 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 uh, and what uh, what made you go into this area in the first place? Well, we saw a need. I have a partner in business, and we mm -hmm. we were in, uh, I was in risk. He was in security. We were in the same firm. Mm -hmm. We would occasionally interact with law enforcement for a variety of reasons. So we became familiar with this notion of extra duty, and just saw a need that this is a kind of a messy market. There's not. Um, um, a smooth and good and accepted way, a normal way of, of um, attaining and paying for and scheduling the officers and so on. So, mm -hmm. I, and, and, you know, somewhat out of our, our frustration too, uh, he more so than I would occasionally hire extra duty officers, right. see the pain and suffering firsthand. So, you know, as I say, discontent is the mother <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> and, 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 th and that's what really brought us to, like, we thought there's got to be a better way. And, you know, we initially we started with doing things in a slightly better way and then incrementalized our, our way to doing things in a much better way for uh, municipalities that has been more broadly accepted now.
And I think that's a great point for, for people to take away, especially you know, entrepreneurs. It sometimes is that you don't have to come up with the big idea that changes everything immediately. As you just said, like the incremental improvement, uh, sometimes you know, that's enough to start out with because let's face it, any kind, when, when there's a big pain point, any kind of improvement is welcome. Yeah, and even within an individual sale, that's typically, you know, for, for smaller agencies, um, it, it, it's fairly black and white. Here's what we do. And, you know, we understand how you do, how you um, administer your program. We'll administer it that way. But a lot of times for larger agencies that we go into, even the sale itself is incrementalized. Well, we'll come in and we'll say, here is generally what we do. We can do it in a, a bunch of highly customized ways. Tell us what you do and what your needs are. And from there, we incrementalize to a solution that fits them. And then even after we start serving them, a lot of times the first three to you know six months or so, we're making changes in what we do because they didn't realize that, wow, there's a, we're doing it this way, but there's a better way to do it. So I, I, I agree with you. I think um, incrementalizing a, a solution to the best place is typically better than dropping a bomb because you're when you you know drop the bomb you're hoping that you hit the target mm -hmm. whereas when you're incrementalizing there you have a much better probability of getting there even though it might take a little bit longer yeah and and to your point earlier you're more likely to build that long-term relationship because you're working closely with the people that you're serving and you're almost like iterating together as you go which then right like i said like together. a consultative sale where you're helping mm -hmm. them as you go and, and there's a a trust building element to that where you're going to have to build some trust before they start, you know, take, freely taking the advice. But once that happens, then, you know, you have a very deep relationship with that entity and it, it would be hard to shake you off of it. Yeah, no, I don't think that's a, that, that's a great, uh, a great point to make. And I think obviously, as you were saying earlier, then if that's the kind of selling that you enjoy and you've got the patience for it and you're willing to learn this, and as you say, it sounds like this is a great, a great area to be in uh, because of the long-term relationships you can build. Yeah, well, we, you know, I think we have a 98, 99% retention rate. Um, right. We have relationships with all these departments and municipalities, um, you know, with CFOs, with mayors and so on. So it, it is worth the investment, but it's an investment. Yeah. And, and but to your point, I mean, that's fantastic to think that you've got it like a 98 or whatever it is retention rate, considering that a lot of your constituents um, move out, change, like mayors come and go, yep. police chiefs come and go. Yeah, and you, and that's usually exactly what happens. When, when we're at risk is when there are change, changes like mm -hmm. that, because you might have a new, say, sheriff or police chief come in and say, well, I don't, I don't want to manage service for anything. I want to do everything by myself. And it's yeah. nothing, no bad thing that you did, no mistake, sure. but it's just a different attitude. So that's where there's a bit of a risk, where, where there's those touch points. But even there, there's, you know, very rarely does that happen. Usually one guy goes to the next and we're still there. Yeah, that's fantastic. Listen, Rich, this has been awesome. Uh, before we go, all of Rich's uh, information will be in his contributor bio, but please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and about Extra Duty Solutions. Yeah, so Extra Duty Solutions, as we alluded to in, in our talk here, we ad administer what are called extra duty or off duty or secondary employment programs for law enforcement. An extra duty program is when law enforcement agents, police officers, deputies work in their off hours for, for a private concern. So if you go to a movie theater on Saturday night, you see a uniformed officer there or in a cruiser out front, that officer typically is not on duty at that time. He's being paid by the, 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 the movie theater chain to be there and he can go into on duty at any time he needs to, um, but he's stationed there and being paid by that entity. So those um, programs cause a large administrative burden for law enforcement agencies. You're taking calls from all these different uh, customers who are interested in hiring the officers. You have to schedule the officers, you have to pay the officers, you have to invoice, you have to collect. You're basically running a security firm within a law enforcement agency. So we take away all the administrative and, and financial burden and, and, and we administer it under the rules and as an agent of the agency. Uh, and we charge a small administrative fee to the customer so it doesn't cost the agency anything either. So that's in a, in a nutshell sort of uh, what, we, what we do and we're the, I think the largest and the fastest growing company that does this in the law enforcement agency world. 
Yeah, no, it's a it's a it's a fascinating business and uh, and a great example of of spotting a need and bringing a solution there. So I think that should give encouragement to anybody out there that if you look hard enough, you can you can find somewhere where there's there's a pain point that you can meet. And as we said earlier, and I think that's another great takeaway for anybody listening or watching is don't try and come out with the mega solution immediately. Just come out, you know, figure out how to do it a little better than it is today. Yeah, when we started, uh, you know, our first client was almost five years ago and how we serve that client and how we serve clients that we onboarded this mm -hmm. month are two different things, you know. Now the first client, you know, they're being served the same way that the onboarded clients this month are being served with all the technology we have and all the, the, where, the, the, the wherewithal. But we move them along to that point as opposed to starting with them at right. that point because we didn't, we didn't know what good looks like. We were creating a new industry, you know? Yeah, no, this has been really fascinating. Again, thanks, Rich. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner, CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you.